school lesson. We thank and praise God. Father, we thank you for our lesson today as we search the scriptures to get a clear understanding of who Jesus is, his miracles and his abilities, which prove that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is God in flesh. We praise you and thank you. Allow your Holy Spirit to open up our understanding and give us the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Okay, so if you have any questions as we do our study today, uh, we hopefully that you will uh, uh, respond by asking your question. The statement that we want to look at today in our uh, understanding that Jesus, the Messiah, has the, his abilities and miracles, the statement is that he, he demonstrated his power in casting out demons, healing of various sorts, uh, performing miracles, all of this proves that he is the Messiah. He is God. Now, understand this, that the word Messiah, let's note that, I want you to make note of that. The word Messiah in the Old Testament, as well as the New, but mainly in the Old, it speaks of him, God coming in flesh. That's the Messiah, God coming in flesh, Emmanuel. Okay? So it's, it's been prophesied in the Old Testament that the Deliverer, the Messiah, is coming. We went forth last lesson dealing with Jesus being God. Right? We dealt with him being Messiah. So each time a person, whether they realize it or not, every time they say Jesus Christ, his name shall be called Jesus, not Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to change anything. Of course, we identify him, who he is, as Jesus Christ, but we got to understand that the word Christ is Messiah. The word Messiah is the incarnated God the Son of God. So what is the phrase Son of God, Messiah, God in flesh, they're the same. So when we say Jesus Christ, when an individual say Jesus Christ, in actuality, they are confessing that Jesus is God. Okay? Everyone understand that? So by saying that his name is Jesus Christ, he is God. This is why in Matthews, recorded in Matthews, uh, Jesus asked the Pharisees, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? What do you think about the Messiah? Well, whose son is he? Is he the son of David or he's the son of God? If he's the son of God, that, that means that because the phrase itself, son of God, is the incarnated God. Is God in flesh. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. So Emmanuel, Messiah, Christ is the same. Jesus Christ. Everyone follow me, right? Okay? So, while on earth, we're going to be looking at, while on earth, Jesus demonstrated, showed his abilities to prove that he is God by the miracles and the power he demonstrated that only God could do. No ordinary human could do what Jesus did perform. Right. Now we we 
I, I, I think what we've done is we read quickly or we don't get the very essence when when Jesus at one time told the boys to get into the boat and go into the water and go to the other side of the lake. When they got into the boat, when they got midway in the water, you know, it's a, it's a big lake, the river, whatever you want to call it, when they got halfway there across the lake, the storm came and it was tossing the boat and water was getting into the boat and they were fearful. Right? This was late at night, very late at night at the turn of the morning hour now and here comes Jesus walking on the water. Now the gospel writer says that he would have passed right by them except they saw him and they got scared because they thought they saw a ghost, a spirit. Jesus yelled out to them, be not afraid, it is I. In one of the Gospels, it said, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, let me come out to you. Jesus said to Peter, come. So Peter went to the side of the boat, took his leg and put it on the water, and then took his other leg and crossed it over and put it on the water and started walking to Jesus on water. As soon as he got almost close to Jesus, the water was waving in tempest and was getting rough. Peter lost sight of himself and began to sink. Jesus reached forth his hand and pulled him out from being drowned, and they both walked back to the boat. What we're going to look at throughout the Gospel of Mark, so that's where I want you to turn now to the Gospel of Mark, chapter uh, 1. So turn your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, all right, chapter uh, 1. Let's, let's look at that. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it was proclaimed that when the Messiah comes, when the Messiah comes, he will perform great power. He will demonstrate who he is. This is the reason why Jesus gave the same power to the apostles. Matthew chapter 10. What he did, he gave to his apostles. You can read that in Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 1. And this is the reason why we do not have apostles today, because they cannot demonstrate those same miracles and abilities that Jesus did. But the apostles, the 12 apostles, did. And one of the features or qualifications or proof that you are an apostle is that you must demonstrate the same supernatural power that Jesus demonstrated on earth. Now, those that are apostles today, why do, why can't they do that now? So something is something is wrong, right? Okay. Now it's nothing wrong, it's just that they need to stop calling themselves and pretending to be apostles and prophets today and just be called elders, ministers, men of God. Right. In Mark's Gospel, let's turn to Mark, chapter 1. Jesus, in order to said about his ministry, he had to be anointed. As a prophet, he had to be anointed. In the Old Testament, before a prophet began his duties or a king began his duty, they had to be anointed. The king had to be anointed by the prophet 
for the prophet had to be anointed by another prophet or by God. So in this case, Jesus had to be anointed, and his anointment came through the baptism of John the Baptist. Right? That's the baptism of Jesus. That's what chapter Mark, chapter 1, Matthew, chapter 3, and you go on throughout the Gospels, you see. When we come to chapter 1 of John's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, let's start at verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's verses 14 and 15. So this ushered in his supreme ministry and performing abilities and miracles, Jesus is now going to set about, from, from the next three and a half years, he's going to set about to prove that he is the Messiah, that he is God in flesh, he is the deliverer, the Savior. Right. Okay, now, when we drop down uh, from 16 down to 23, that's where we're going to go to now, verse 23, Mark 1, 23, so we're going to be skipping now and then in marks, okay? So try and keep up. If you uh, lose, lose, if I lose you, just yell out, uh, you know, signal to me, okay? In verse 23, Mark 1, 23, there was in their synagogue a man. Now, a synagogue was a place of worship for the Jewish people after the temple was destroyed. Uh, there was no temple at this time. In a, in a great manner that the people wanted to go to. It, it was, excuse me, it was a temple, but th there were certain, there were certain dignitaries, let me put it right, dignitaries and certain individuals that could be, get into the temple and people didn't want to bother, so they went to a synagogue. That was a closed section building, smaller than the temple site. But if you, you could go to the temple because there was Herod Temple at that time. That's why I changed my story. There was a temple. It's called Herod's Temple. Herod uh, it, it rebuilt the temple and, and made it more beautiful and gorgeous uh, than before. And the Jews, the political Jews, the religious Jews uh, uh, accepted that. But there were other Jews that didn't want to go to the temple, and so they met in a synagogue. Word synagogue is another word for assembly, congregation, church. All right. Verse 23, there was, a, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out. Uncle, see, the un, in other words, the demon that possessed this guy caused him to be unclean in every way. Whatever you want to describe the word unclean, that's how his body was, his clothes was. He was unclean, and he cried out. Let us alone. Now, this is the demon, the spirit that is in the man. Verse 24, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you come to destroy us? I know that you are who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Now he was, the, the demon was speaking out loud. Most likely, people was looking around in the synagogue saying, who's talking? See, because the demon is invisible. It's speaking through the man. Uh, you know how some people say, I heard voices. This is what it is. You're looking around in the synagogue. Somebody is talking. They was yelling at Jesus, saying, let us alone. We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. See, they knew who Jesus really was. See, what they was attempting to do is to get Jesus to bypass the cross. 
because it's been prophesied that he had to be smitten of God, put to death, offered as a sacrifice. See, all that is Old Testament prophecy. Demon, Satan and his cohorts of demons, they know the scriptures. Verse 25, Jesus rebuked him, saying, hold your peace, come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, okay, see, verse 26, what had happened was, when Jesus spoke the words, the spirit, the, the demon inside the guy, was through the guy on the floor. And whether the guy was scratching himself, hitting himself, falling all, rolling all over the floor, does that sound familiar? Rolling all over the floor, the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. The people were amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits and they do obey him. Okay, now that, that's, that's one episode there, proving that Jesus has commands over Satan and his forces. And they told him to come out of it. This fame immediately is spread abroad throughout the regions round about Galilee. And it was a point that the people gathered in verse what is it, 30, or verse 29, they gathered together and they came out of the synagogue because Jesus left the synagogue and they came out of the synagogue and they were gathering now into the house of Simon, that's Simon Peter, and Andrew, his brother. With them was James and John, verse 30. Now Simon's wife, Peter's wife, mother, that's his mother-in-law, Peter was married. His wife, his wife's mother was sick of a fever. So they had once told Jesus about her. He came to Simon's mother-in-law and took her by the hand, verse 31, and lift her up and immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto him. Now as, 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 as we look into the Gospel of Mark, as time progressed, we're going to see one after another that Jesus began to do extraordinary things. And each extraordinary thing that he did, it proved that he showed the ability that he is God, that he is the Messiah. It, 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 he, he performed miracles after miracles that no one else could do. They were amazed, the people around were amazed at Jesus. Let's read on, verse 34. He healed many, I'm looking at verse, okay. He healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the demons to speak because they knew him. Uh, so it, it's amazing if, if, if men and women today is going to try and impersonate being an apostle or even impersonate being Jesus. Where are your abilities? Where are your miracles? Where are your supernatural demonstrations that you are God? This is what you have to prove. One, Jesus performed divers miracles, various abilities to prove that he is God. Those same power that he demonstrated, right, the scripture tells us right, in Matthew chapter 10 that he gave it to his apostles. He gave them power against 
unclean spirit to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Now, if you're claiming to be an apostle or a prophet, or if, if you have elevated your consciousness so high and blasphemy is saying that you are Jesus, then where are your abilities? Where are your miracles? Where is the profound power that you need to demonstrate to prove who you are? Now, number one, hypothetically, let's just say hypothetically, suppose you are an apostle and you and you do do these miracles. What's the need for the Bible then? The scriptures. You can't have both. You, 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 can't ha you can't have supernatural abilities to cast out demons, to do, heal all manner of sickness and diseases, and, at, and, and have these powers, and then have the work. So you can only have one, the word of God or the power of God. Because they, they, you can't have both. This is the reason why we do not have men or anyone in the church today since the death of John, uh, that's the last apostle, that can demonstrate and have the power to heal all manner of sickness and disease and cast out demons and heal all kinds of sicknesses. Because now all that was in part. Today we have the perfect word of God. We don't need those elements of supernatural demonstration today because we have the word of God. Those supernatural characteristics and demonstration prove that they were sent by God. And remember, the children of Israel approach Moses and say, Moses, how do we know that an individual is a prophet of God? Deuteronomy chapter 18. How do we know? The question is still asked today. How do we know today whether an individual is an apostle or a prophet or a soothsayer or is called from God? Because you've got so many today. So many. And some are performing some of their wildest tricks or demonstrations and it's so deceptive that a lot of people are being deceived. How do we know? By the means of the Word of God. This is why the Word of God is kept hidden from the congregation. And when you have a lot of shouting, speaking in tongues, miracles, and fantasies, and, 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 and outbursts of emotions and songs and everything, there's a such a 5%, even lower percentage of the preaching, the true preaching of the Word of God. Okay? So that's why you can't have a consistency of miracles, signs, and wonders with the Word of God. You can only have one. So you, they both cannot coexist together by man. Man cannot perform supernatural abilities to prove that he is God and then turn around and preach the word of God at the same time. From the word of God, the written word of God. The apostles did it because they did not have the completeness of the word of God as we have today. 1 Corinthians 13 and 8 when that which is perfect is come, that which in part shall be done away with. So it behooved Christ, as we see in Isaiah chapter 61, I want you to turn there now, and then you turn, the prophet Isaiah chapter 61. The prophet Isaiah prophesies on various occasions that the Messiah will come and when he comes, he's going to demonstrate such supernatural ability that's going to prove that he is the Messiah. 
See, instead of people today listening to the sound teaching of the Word of God, that alone proves that a person is called by God. They want miracles. They, they are testing to the to miracles. They, they say that if you're of God, you're going to have a large church, a good congregation, wealth, prosperity, miracles, healing, miracles in the church. That, all that authenticates that God called you. But the scripture says, no, Timothy preached the word. So the average person, the majority of people in church, they want a miracle. They want to be touched. They want to be aroused. They don't want sound teaching of the word of God. See, that's why we said earlier, you cannot have them both. They will not coexist the both together by man. Today, only God can heal. Only God alone can perform miracles if he choose to. But you see, in the early church and in the Old Testament, men chose when and where through the power of God how to heal and demonstrate the new supernatural power given to them by God. Okay? In Isaiah chapter 61, the scripture says, as I say on the board here, Isaiah 61, starting at verse 1, co-lines with Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 22. They both go together. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord, the Jehovah, has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, what the church has done, they have looked at this in a literal fashion okay and they have taken this that there's nothing wrong with going to prison there's nothing wrong with certain organizations are doing for the homeless the poor and we need the church need to do that true but this is not what you cannot use this scripture to prove your organization and what it does you're saying, well, I'm doing what Jesus did. Now, here, in Isaiah 61, the implication is in a spiritual application only. How so? He has anointed me to preach the good tidings, the gospel. The word good tidings is a, uh, the, 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 the word itself is in the Greek. Remember, the Old Testament is written in the and in the Greek also because it was written in the Septuagint, meaning the 70s, all right, and it was written in Greek as well as the Old Testament. So it's evangelon, evangelon. It's a Greek word means to evangelize, good news. So it's good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Jesus did not come to free slaves. He did not come to stop slavery. He did not come. His mission and his work, what he came to do, is to die for sin. Sinners bring many out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God to save. That was his ministry. And that's why when you see these words to proclaim liberty to the captives, open the opening of the prison, the people think that the church job is to get people out of prison, break it down, abolish it, because they need to be set free. We need to get rid of slavery, we need to get rid of slaves, and we need to, see, that's 
Jesus didn't come to do that. Now, I know people will object to this, but you have to understand that this scripture here is a spiritual application here in dealing with Isaiah chapter 61, 1 and following. It has nothing to do with the natural or physical application in which we think we need to do. Freeing someone from slavery, abolishing slavery, getting people out of prison, feeding the hungry, that is secondary, third, and whatever. The main course is to free people from the slavery of sin. To give them liberty because they're captive by Satan and the forces of darkness. This is what that scripture is talking about. Now, to prove that, remember in our text in Mark, now to prove what I just said, I know I'm, I'm back and forth, but because, see, I have to uh, show you something. Back in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Go back to Mark. Keep your hand on Isaiah 61, man, and just you know, or put a pencil there and come on back to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. With the statement I just said, I'm, I'm going to prove what I just said through the scriptures. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 35. In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out. Now remember, the people were thronging and coming to see Jesus. They left the synagogue with Jesus, and they entered Peter's house, and that's where they was at. They was, boy, they was there, and they was, you know, they was calling up Peter's house. Jesus was preaching and healing. It got late. Early in the morning, verse 35, Jesus woke up, before, you know, the cock crowed, before the, you know, the sun rose, and he went out. He departed into a solitary place. And there he prayed. Now, verse 36, and Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And, and when they found him, they said to him, why are you here? All the men are seeking you. I mean, come on back. Come on back to and do some more healing. And now notice what Jesus says in verse 38. This is going to prove the point that I was trying to give to you in Isaiah 61. Verse 38. Mark 138. Jesus said unto them, Let us go into the next town that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. I didn't really come to heal people, to cast out demons, to do this and do that. My main mission is to seek the lost, to become a ransom, and to save many. That's why Paul said Christ came into the world to die for sin. All the miracles the wonders that he demonstrated and did was just to prove who he is. Just to prove who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. Right. As John tells us in John chapter 20, many other signs that Jesus did And many other signs truly that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The name is what? Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. Yes, you are. Savior. All right. Let's 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 continue in the, the gospel of, of Mark. In chapter two, again he entered into Capernaum after some days, 
there was noise that he was in the house. Straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. They come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. Now, the palsy is a, is a person that is physically handicapped and has a disorder, has a severe disorder. Not only that he or she is handicapped, but he's a person that has seizures, his disruptions in the mind that causes seizures. With electricity and stuff. I don't want to get too much detail. That causes a person to have seizures and foaming at the mouth and they can't take care of themselves. That's a person that is of the palsy. So they brought this individual to the palsy. When they, verse 4, and when they come near unto him for the press, see, remember now, they couldn't get through the door. They couldn't get a back door. They couldn't get through the window because it was crowded. But notice in verse uh, 4, they uncovered the roof where he was. They broken it up. And they let, see, they, they tied the man in the bed with a rope and let him down in the, in the room towards Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, see, see the man who was very, of, of the palsy was very sick, somehow he had communicated to the people, I want Jesus. I want to hear, I want him here. And also the people that, that, that brought him knew that if they could get Jesus, get this guy to Jesus, Jesus could help him. So in verse 6, at the, at the middle part, it says, Jesus saw their faith. Now, how do you see faith? Class, how do you see faith? I mean, you, you see my hand, right? I'm raising my hand. You don't see faith. You see my hand. But, but how do you see faith? You can't. You, huh? Faith, faith is, 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 is the substance of things unseen. It, you can't see faith. The only way you can see faith, faith has to be seen by works. You have to see. If you believe something, you're going to carry it out, you're going to do it. That proves that you have faith. That shows people around, your surrounding, that you have faith. So when Jesus says, in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of their palsy, Son, your sins be forgiven. Now, oh boy, he done started something now. Because see, earlier in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament time, two things you could not do. It was blasphemy. You could not say that you are God Two, you could not say you could forgive sin because only God can forgive sin. Those are the two damnable things that could get you really in trouble in society, in the, in the Jewish society at that time in the Old Testament as well as in the time of Jesus. But Jesus had the boldness, openly, loudly said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Look at verse but there were certain of the scribes, a scribe is a teacher, one who is fully educated, knowledgeable of the Old Testament, the Torah, the articles of the law. He writes things down. He's an instructor, some of them are. And he knows the scriptures. Certain of the scribes sitting there, they reasoning in their hearts. Notice the words here now. This is why we're taking our time. See the words here. They're thinking in their heart. They didn't say anything openly. If you hear me, they didn't say it openly. They're reasoning in their heart. They're putting all this together. They're figuring all this out in their heart. 
Now this is what they're saying in their heart, in their heart, verse 7, in their mind. Why does this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? See, this is what they're thinking in their mind. Verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, now let me stop right there. Now this is the reason why on the board here, I got some of the uh, uh, abilities that Jesus demonstrated. He demonstrated that he is eternal. He demonstrated that he is unchangeable. He demonstrated that he is omnipresent, omnipotent, perfect, incomprehensive, and omniscient, omniscient, and much, much more. I just name a few. Now, you, you, you see that in verse 8, Jesus perceived in his heart, in his mind, the word is spirit there, that they reason within themselves. Now, when you're talking to me, Unless you have the skill, unless a person has the skill of being a therapist, a counselor, or some skill of reading people expressions or body movement, you won't know. You know, it's, it's, it's a matter. If I'm talking to you and I'm trying to instruct you or tell you something and you're folding your hands like this, and you're saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that lets me know that you're not, see, by you folding your hands on this, on this chest, and that let me know that you, I don't care what you say, I, say what you want to say, I'm going to, you know, it's your, your eyebrows, your, your facial, your hands, your movement of your body, your crossing of your legs, even when you sit in a chair, when you sit to the left side or the right side, if you're slumping in your chair, see, all that is showing a person what are you thinking, whether you realize it or not, okay? You know? So Jesus, when he perceived what they was reasoning within themselves, he came out and said in the latter part of verse 8, look, look at that, why reason ye these things in your heart? <laughs> now that right there could have, if someone said to me, Sherman, I know what you're thinking. I'd be hey, I mean, be careful what I'm thinking around this guy. But they didn't, they ignored it. So in verse 9, what, whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up your bed and walk. But you may know, verse 10, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Now listen to me now. I say to the sick of a palsy, he turned from them and turned to the sick of the Rise up, verse 11, Take up your bed, go into your house. Now, if this man rose up, fold up his laundry and his bedding, and went home, Jesus said in verse 9, this will prove that I can forgive sins. So, arise, take up your bed, and go into your house. And then look at verse 12. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, went forth before them all. You know, this, this, this is amazing. Now, let me usher this in. How many of you have been to a meeting, or know of a meeting, or see it on TV, or or meet social media or whatever. And these prayer meetings, these healing crusades, revivals, people get saved. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember in this segment of Jesus of Nazareth. 
I say, let me use that as an example. In the movie, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, in the movie, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus came into the synagogue and he healed a man. He couldn't walk. Jesus told the man, this is in the movie, Jesus of Nazareth, he says, rise up and walk. Now you notice, in the movie, in churches, in crusades, People all the time stutter, walk slow. They are very hesitant to obey. And they start getting, you know, they, you notice when they say, get out of the wheelchair, throw away the crutches, you notice that there's a hesitance to get rid of one crutch, then the next crutch. Or when they get up out of the wheelchair, they get up, very slowly and put their foot off to the pedal and put it on the ground. And then they take the other step and put it, the other foot and put it on the ground and they ease themselves up. They turn around and hold to the arm of the chair, the wheelchair, and start getting up. Or if they're laying down, they, they, they sort of roll on their side and they try to get up. In the Gospels, of the Bible, the four Gospels, and in the book of Acts. See, I'm pointing this out. And the reason need be because of that one word in verse 12. See in verse 12? See that second word? What it says? What's the second word in verse 12? Immediately. He didn't, throughout the miracles of Jesus, even in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John came to the temple, and the man standing at the footstep of the, of the, of the, of the gate, alms, alms for the poor, give me something, Peter and John said, look on us. Silver and gold have I not, but such as I give unto you, I say in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. This is Acts chapter 3. What does the scripture say next? Immediately the man jumped up and started bouncing around, running. That illustrates, even in the time of Paul's ministries, miracles, people immediately was healed. Why is it in crusades, revivals, tent meetings, Snake services, you know, people come together to be healed, bitten by snakes, and then be healed. Do all this stuff take so long for a person to heal? Um, there's another movie, I forgot his name, or it's, it's two movies, three of them really. Um, Robert Duvall played, it's called, I think it's, it's called, the movie is called The Apostle, a Pentecostal preacher. He left his wife uh, and he went down south and he became a uh, ordained preacher in a, in a Pentecostal church and he was preaching and they were saying, saying stuff, healing people, miracles, but it wasn't instantly, it wasn't immediately. Then it's another movie with uh, Steve Martin, he was a, a preacher riding on the bus with another girl, the lady that played uh, Lois Lane in Superman, Margaret Kidder, I think her name is. And he, he did the same thing. And, and, and the amazing thing that shocked him at the end of almost the movie was this boy really did get healed in his crusade. See, that's where you got to be careful also that sometimes God in his own mercy and compassion and you're going to see that throughout the Gospel of Mark Jesus showed compassion but the preacher get the credit and some of these miracles crusades and revivals a person is genuinely healed I, 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 don't, I don't doubt that but it Miraculously, it is at the same time that God chooses to heal that little boy, that girl, or that whatever it may be. But the majority of time is fake, is phony, is hypocrisy. 
But nevertheless, we should not be duped into thinking I can go to a revival, a miracle service, a healing service, a crusade, and get a blessing from God. And this is what people want. Today is Sunday. New Year's Eve. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. I'm sorry. Christmas Eve. And a lot of people are in church or preparing to go to church. Some have already been to church in the other part of the world. They already had their two services already. And they went there for a blessing, for healing. They didn't come for salvation. They didn't come to repent. They came for a healing, a blessing, or prosperity, or something to happen to change their lives. They came to get a fix. You know, like alcoholism and drug addiction. They came in church, they do the same thing in a spiritual way. They come to get a fix. And once they get that fix, they get that shouting out. Some people come with their shouting shoes, their shouting clothes, their shouting cloth, the anointing oil, and whatever the case may be. And that's the purpose of them coming. All what Jesus did in his three and a half years in performing miracles, signs, and wonders were to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And that believing that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, you can have eternal life. Trusting in a miracle. If you say you're saved because a miracle happened in your life, it is all, po what, it, it is all possibility that you're not really saved. And what I mean by that, you went to church, you went to a crusade, you went to a revival, you went, you, you, you was watching 700 Club or something on TV or on the social media, and they told you to put your hands on the TV and say, believe and trust God, this miracle will happen to you, God has something fantastic for you, and I want you right now to gather around the TV, around the radio, you're back in the 60s and going backwards, you have the radio to put your hands on. TV didn't do it because a lot of people didn't have TV. They worked with you know. And even today, you you went to this crusade and you went up forth in your wheelchair, in your sickness, in your depressive mood, in your bipolar depressive mood. You were suicidal or you were schizophrenic, whatever the condition, you was an alcoholic, you was a, a, a whatever you was, you went up forward. And the guy anointed you and laid hands on you and you felt tremendously clean and blessed and you start crying. From henceforth, you felt that you were saved. You were delivered. See, that's how people think that they're saved because they, was they think they were delivered on that occasion. And that prompts them to think in their mentality that they are a Christian. They're saved because something happened in their life and change them. They used to beat their wives. They used to spend all their paycheck on gambling or drugs. There was a prostitute. There was alcoholic, whatever. You, you, you went for, you was laid hands on, you was anointed, and right, you stopped doing those things. Many people take that as, I'm saved. They don't know if they die, they're dying in their sin. They have, they have 95% of faith in being cured of their disease, of their sickness, you know, and they really think that they're safe. This is the reason why, see, some think that because they haven't drank alcohol or taken drugs for a whole year, I'm delivered. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. That's good if you haven't taken a drink or did drugs or sold your body 
or molest someone or kill someone, and you didn't drink, that, that's tremendous. My hat go off to you. Very good. But you, but you need to repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Outwardly, you may have done a great deed towards yourself by not drinking, laying in the bed, fornicating, alcohol, drug addiction, prostitution, incest, or, or molestation, uh, and all what you're going through. And you went up to be delivered. And you don't do those things no more. That doesn't that that is not salvation. You may think it is. And you've been that way for five years, for ten years, for twenty years. And as time went by, your motivation in within your heart and mind has gripped you so that you really think that you're truly saved. So when even when you hear a message of salvation, you cast it aside, like Arthur Pink says, you cast it aside because you really think that it's not talking to you, it's talking to somebody else. Because you are cocksure that you're already saved. Not knowing that you're really not. So later on, in the ministry of Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark and Gospel of Luke, the Synoptic Gospel, Jesus says, Hearken, behold, a sore went forth to sow seed. You see the fourth? Some fell on this, some fell on that, some. Because he knew there's going to be a lot of people that's going to trust in miracles, signs, and wonders so emphatically gripped in their hearts and minds that they really think that they are saved. And they they do good do good deeds. They may be in church, and if they're in church, they pay their offering, they may be singing in the choir, they don't smoke, drink, and you know, and then some are not even in church, but they know that they are saved. There was a reason why Jesus, as in the Gospel of Mark, Mark and illustrated earlier than Matthew and Luke about the parable of the sower. Because Jesus didn't want people to get around thinking that because they were healed, because they're following Jesus, because he raised that girl from the dead, or because Lazarus did this, or because they ate of the loaves of bread, that they were truly saved. These people that still ate in John chapter 8 of the bread, Jesus says, no, you, you still eat, have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. John 6 or 7, I am the light of the world, he that follows me. Just because you don't go to the temple and, and, and do all that voodoo and witchcraft and you start going to church, Jesus says, don't think because you do that you're saved. So next week we're going to look at the more miracles in the Gospel of Mark and, and on your own you can just randomly go through the book of Mark beginning at chapter uh, 2 and 3 and 4 and you see that in the ultimate terms Jesus proved that you need the miracle of the new birth. You need the miracle of the new birth. So we're going to continue next week in proving that Jesus, as being the Messiah, he's going to demonstrate such power to prove that he is God, that he alone can save. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessed word of God. We thank you for the truth of your word. We pray that for many who are held captive by Satan and sin, thinking that they are saved because they received a miracle or a blessing, we pray that you would shatter that imagination that is in their hearts and minds and cause them to repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
Blessed is your name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Coming up at 11.30 is our worship service. Amen. At 5 o'clock, we're coming back for our evening service in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. God bless. All right.